welcome to the class. This is CISS 243, uh, Web Database Integration. Um, has anyone finished the first assignment yet? So you guys are all behind. I see. Just kidding. I just made a, a quick change to it. So I'm glad that no one worked ahead and, and, and completed it because you'd have had to go and revise it. And at any rate, uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to spend some time covering a little bit about how this class has been organized, how this class will be organized, and uh, then get into the, the topic of, uh, uh, of the course. Um, time to take attendance. I've been assured through countless Facebook posts of my kids and their friends that no one likes to introduce themselves and tell a fun fact about themselves. So I will spare you that. All right. So instead, you need to say a boring fact about yourself. No, I'm just kidding. No facts unless you absolutely feel the need to share one, in which case, share away. All right. Um, I have no fun facts because I don't have any fun. All right. Um, I should start recording. Oh, I did start recording. Good. We should be capturing these pearls of wisdom for future generations, right? Uh, the class will be recorded, and a, a big thing about that is that um, it allows you, if you miss a class, to watch the recording. And it's not as good as being there, right? But uh, at least you can sort of get uh, the information. Um, and I also upload the examples that I do in class as well. So if you miss that way, the idea is that, well, you know, you won't be uh, as compromised as you would be if there was no recording of the class. So that's really the purpose of recording it. And then I use these recordings when I teach this class online. So like when I, in, in spring semester, I'll teach it online. So um, the... Uh, the uh, recordings will be, um, you know, from probably from this, this class. Uh, it's interesting if you are taking me in person and online for classes to see the difference between the length of my hair, the length of my beard, all those sorts of things. Probably my weight, to be honest about it, you know, uh, how all those things are in constant fluctuation. And especially if I have to go back and fill in a recording with an even older recording, then it's really all bets are off, all right? But assured that it's all me, all right, if you're taking an online class. All right, Jared Adams, Stephen Adams, who said that? Okay. Dale Vante, Richard Baker, Stanley Becker, Joseph Sandrowski, Michael DiCarlo, Mark Kirshner, Justin Mesker, Jessica Rosario, uh, William Silvestro. Okay. <laughs> Angela Skinner, Candace Traster, Jason White. Hi. Okay. Kyle Winkleman. And Jaden. This might be the first class where everyone has showed up, so pat yourself on the back for that. All right. Um, just, just to to get a sense of this, how many of you have had me for other classes? Okay. Wow. All right. I know there there's some there's a lot there's a, a lot of faces that look familiar, and there's some names that look familiar that maybe you've had me for an online class. Uh, and all that. I, I do try to be fairly consistent about how I have my classes structured, uh, but there are going to be some changes this semester uh, relating to the lab, and we'll talk about them today. So let's start by looking at the syllabus. I know that is such a fascinating way to begin. And I'm not going to insult you by reading the syllabus to you, all right? If I ever read something that is on the screen to you, you're welcome to start booing, all right? And if 
it goes on for longer than a minute, you're welcome to throw small things at me, like crumpled up paper or like a paper clip or something, not, not like bricks or anything. All right? Because that's one thing that I hate as a listener to a presentation is when people read the screen to me. Uh, I, had, uh, I had an amazing speech teacher uh, in high school, and I think he was like an old military guy. But he like looked and said, when you read to me, I think I can read. In fact, I can read better than you can read. Therefore, if you read to me, you've insulted me, and I will take off points. So I feel the same way. If, if you read something, you know, then I'll just put it up there and tell you to read it, right? All right? What I want to get to is I want to get to the, <laughs> the message behind the words. This is starting to sound like a literature class, right? The message behind the words of the first section of this syllabus, like this section here, the message behind the words is that there's a lot of different ways to contact me. All right? The best way is probably through Canvas email. All right? Why is that the best way? Well, I make a point of checking that pretty much every day. All right? Uh, Canvas email is pretty much exclusively from the students, all right, that I'm currently teaching. Therefore, I consider it a priority, all right? My normal LC email, I get all kinds of emails, you know, FYIs and just messages and roads being closed and this, that, and the other. And sometimes things get a little bit lost in the shuffle, all right? So it's better to, probably best to send me uh, emails via Canvas. But if you're in a pinch, you don't have Canvas on your mobile phone, for example, and you need to send me an email about something, or Canvas is down or whatever, probably the next best way is sending it to my regular LorraineCCC.edu email account. All right? The phone is a way, but... The phone is probably not one of the better ways, simply because I don't really check my phone messages except when I'm on campus. So if you had a question about something, uh, let's say on a Thursday, uh, and you sent me a voicemail, I probably wouldn't get it till the following Monday, you know, if you, if you sent it, you know, Thursday evening, let's say, if you had a question about something. It would be better to send me an email, because the email I'll, I'll probably see the next day. I'll probably see Friday. Whereas if you sent me a voicemail Thursday evening, I probably wouldn't see it till the following Monday. So you can send me voicemail if everything else fails, all right, but emails are probably better. Now, my office hours, uh, right now I haven't, I haven't figured them out yet. Um, usually, you know, my final schedule isn't determined oftentimes until like right before the semester. So I need to now look at what my schedule is and figure out what works best for that. And I should be publishing them sometime this week, what my office hours are. But you should know that those office hours aren't carved in stone. In other words, if you can't make those office hours, contact me and we'll figure something out. All right? If, if the only day you can make it is Friday and I'm not here on Friday, that doesn't mean that I can't be here on Friday, if just because it's not scheduled. All right, so contact me and we'll figure it out. Here's another thing I do, and I will be publishing dates and times or days and times for these too. Is that you're welcome to show up for any of my other classes labs. All right, I have uh, several classes uh, Monday through Thursday, and. I invite anyone from any of my classes to come to any of my other classes' labs. So if you have a question, let's say, and you, you know, you're welcome to come to my Wednesday Intro to Web Development Lab, all right? And I'll do my best to try to answer any questions that you have, all right? So we'll talk about, I'll, I'll publish a list of those and maybe some guidelines for visiting the other labs uh, soon this week, but that's another option. Uh, we can Skype. 
A uh, nice thing about Skype as opposed to a regular phone call is that we can share screens with each other. So you can show me, like if, you, if you're getting an error, you know, you can actually show me the code and show me the error that you're getting and I can see it and get a better idea troubleshooting it. Um, do contact me before, so like don't just think that you can Skype me anytime, you know. Um, consider it like an appointment. That, that, you know, if, if you were wanting to Skype me, like, you know, we'd set up an appointment Friday at 3 p.m. that we'll meet on Skype and discuss it. We can also talk on the phone or even through Canvas's online chat if that worked the best. The point of this is, is I almost try to come with, up with a ridiculous number of ways that you can contact me. Just to point out that my goal is to be very accessible to you and to be there for you whenever you have questions. All right. Um, it's important in this class and in a lot of classes, you know, not to get too far behind right off the bat. And if you're struggling with something, um, it's okay. In fact, it's encouraged to ask questions. There's something to be said for you wanting to figure out stuff on your own. I know there's some students that say, well, I wanted to figure it out by myself. That's fair. I can relate to that. When I have a problem, I want to figure it out to my, you know, by myself, too. However, there's a point where you're working on something and you feel you're making progress and you think you understand what's going on and you just maybe need to, you know, get the details together and, and you'll be okay. And then there's a time where you're going and you're really just spinning your wheels and you're not making any progress, and you're trying things, and nothing seems to be working, and you're not making any progress at all, that's the time to contact me. We don't want you spinning your wheels, you know. Uh, it's amazing sometimes people tell me they worked a certain number of hours on an assignment, and I'll think that was never my intent for it to be that many hours, right? And if you had to work on it that many hours, then there probably is something that you didn't understand that you should ask about and get clarified. So these assignments are meant to, to test your skills, not to, you know, um, be, you know, be torture for you, you know. Um, so therefore, if you feel that you're spending your wills and not getting, and not making any progress, you know, ask me the question. Now, when you ask a question, I might do a couple things. I might give you an evasive answer. All right? Not because I'm difficult or I'm in a bad mood, but I might give you an answer that maybe will nudge you in the right direction. Have you considered this? Uh, a lot of times when you have this problem, it's because of this. So I'll give you things to look at. I might not come right out and tell you the answer. Because it is best if you figure it out yourself, but by the same token, as students, you do need additional assistance, and that's part of my role is being here. So I might not give you the answer directly. So if I give you an answer like that, um, actually, it probably means I have faith in you that if you get pushed in the right direction, that you will get the answer, all right? Other times, if you have a problem that is really obscure or really difficult, I might come right out and tell you the answer because, hey, I don't, I don't necessarily expect you to be figuring out this subtle of an error. Or, hey, I forgot to mention this in class, so if you run into this problem, yeah, that's, that's the cause of it or whatever. So my answer can take a number of forms with you. I do reserve the right, if you ask a question in class, to defer it over to lab. So maybe we're talking about something and you ask a question that is kind of specific to your project. I might tell you, look, uh, we'll cover that. You know, let's, let's go and talk about it in lab. Um, none of this should discourage you from asking questions, all right? Um, because it's important. If you don't get something, there's a good chance that other people in the class might not get it. It's not that big of a class to where I have to worry about, like, constant interruptions or anything like that. So ask away if you, if you have questions. So that is the point of all this information at the top of the syllabus, which is ways to get a hold of me. Um, 
description and outcomes. These are really what the class is about. In a nutshell, the goals of you when you leave this class. All right? It's important to keep and be aware of them and keep focused on them. Text and materials. There is no text for this class. That being said, uh, I may post information from books or ask you to read stuff from books on Safari online books. Are any of you familiar with Safari books online or Safari was? Yes, yeah, Safari books online. Okay. It's a service that we at the college subscribe to that allows you to read full text of technical books. All right? So, how do you get to it? Well, you can get to it from our library's webpage. So, from our library's webpage, under databases just scroll down Safari Books Online when you go to connect it all right it will ask you your academic institution email all right uh, that is not your personal email account that's the email that Lorraine Community College supplied to you so, I'll put my email address in. And I'll click Let's Go. And gives you a nice welcoming message. All right. Your institution provides you free access to our 35,000 books and 30,000 hours of videos. All right. Wow. it's a lot of stuff. And then what you can do is you can find books on any topic. All right. This is actually good um, if you, you know, you have a textbook in another class, right? You know, if you have if, if you have a textbook for another class and you want to consider saving it. Like, is anyone taking mobile web development? Have you bought the book yet? That might be good for you, right? <laughs> Head first mobile web. <gasps> Looky here. And you can go, like, to table of contents. Here's chapter one. I don't know. Some students hate these, but I love these headfirst books. I think they're kind of funny and and well written. They have nice graphics. So this is full text uh, of the book. Now I know some people aren't crazy about buying or, or reading uh, that, but um, if if it's the comparison between that and spending a certain amount of money. Uh, you know, uh, I, I think it's worthwhile uh, to consider the e-text version. You can always, if you see a book that you really like and you think it will benefit you going forward, you can always go and look for it on Amazon and see how much it is and buy a print copy if that's what you want to do. It's also good if you are taking a class and uh, maybe you are not following your textbook, the, the assigned textbook, and you want some additional information. You know, so, for example, if you're taking a, uh, a, a database class and you're, you're just not getting SQL, you know, you could, you could search for SQL and find a different textbook and look at it, and maybe that would be useful for you. All right. So I may assign stuff from, this, from, some, from, from that database. Uh, uh, again, I'm, I probably will at some point in the semester assign some stuff. Um, so just because there's no textbook doesn't mean I'm leaving you out in the cold, all right? Um, okay. You also are, are required to have a thumb drive or some way to store your work, all right? Because as many of you know, 
uh, the machines here at LC uh, are installed with certain software, Deep Freeze, that when you reboot them, it wipes the drive and starts with a fresh drive. So if you're working on something and you save it, um, then it's not going to be there the next time you come and see it. Uh, you know, assuming someone rebooted, which invariably they will. All right. So um, make sure you take a copy either on a thumb drive. Um, I just bought a eight gigabyte one for like ten bucks yesterday. So those are getting so cheap. All right, that um, you know um, it shouldn't be that huge of an issue for you, especially considering you're saving money on a textbook, right? Most, most textbooks for most courses are probably substantially more than $10, all right? Plus, you can use that thumb drive for all of your classes. If you forgot your thumb drive or you, you, you know, money's really tight, uh, you can, like, email stuff to yourself. Or I think there's even uh, uh, places on Canvas for you to upload files just to your own little file stash. And... Uh, also, you can use Google Drive to save stuff, too. And if you need help with any of these technologies, let me know. I'll be glad to help you out with that. All right, instructor's approach. This is your class. Okay, I read that, but I wanted to really emphasize it. All right? Uh, there, you know, sometimes I've heard instructors joke, you know, did you cover this topic? And it's like, well, yeah, I covered it, but, you know, I don't know if they understood it or not, right? Well, I don't want that to be the case in this class. It doesn't do me any good to check off on a checklist saying, well, I covered SQL statements, or I covered um, model view controller, or I covered yeah. anything like that if you guys didn't get it, right? So, again, I encourage you to ask questions, all right? This isn't that big of a class. There's maybe, what, 16 people in it, give or take, all right? So, you and if a couple other people don't understand something, that's a substantial portion of the class. So, by all means, ask the question. Um, again, we covered that before. I just want to emphasize that uh, again. There's a whole list of college policies that you should see and you should review just to make sure that you understand them and you can take advantage of them. Policies on late work. You don't know how long I spent writing these five paragraphs because I'm really torn about late work. All right. Here's my dilemma about late work. All right. Your students. And your students at a community college, which means that many of you have a lot of other things going on, right? You have other responsibilities, maybe work, maybe home, whatever. So in a, you're, you're, you're not necessarily like students at a other sort of colleges where that's pretty much their full-time job is to be students, right? You, most people, how many people here are working? and have a job, all right, good number of them. And I could ask the same thing about family responsibilities and so on. So everyone has a lot going on. Uh, and therefore, I think it's important for people that teach at a community college to recognize that and to be accommodating for that. So I don't want to burn you just because you got an assignment late. Because in the grand scheme of things, if you understood something Wednesday and the assignment was due Tuesday, I don't really care that much, <laughs> right? You know, so you got it a day later than I said you were supposed to. Not that big a deal, all right? That being said, there are some students, all right, that simply disappear on me, all right? I don't see them for weeks at a time. Don't hear emails from them, whatever. And then much later, I get like maybe six weeks into the semester, I'll get assignment one or assignment two. Well, that seems to me to be a little bit irresponsible. And there is, I think, value in counting off for that. Just to sort of enforce the idea that, hey, you have a responsibility here 
to get your stuff in on a timely basis. So I'm very flexible about my late policy, but I'm not so flexible where anything goes. I guess is sort of the bottom line for this. I will be a lot more flexible for uh, with you if I see you consistently coming to lab, if you ask me questions about some stuff that you're having trouble with, so I know, hey, you're working on this, all right? It's not that you're ignoring it. You're working on it, and you're hung up here or there. And finally, if there's anything uh, personal going on, I don't need details of it, all right? But just a heads up to say, I haven't been feeling well this week. The assignment will be, you know, I should have the assignment due by Friday instead of Wednesday or whatever. That's all you need to say. And if you do that, I'm, I'm bound to be a lot more flexible than if you just literally disappear and start turning in stuff well after the fact. All right? I think that's reasonable. I think it's fair. I think it both accommodates students that have legitimate other issues with responsibility and uh, still forces you to assume some responsibility in getting things done or at least keeping me in the loop. Now, the only thing I will say is that there are students that on occasion use this as a bit of a crutch. All right? They think, well, I'm flexible, uh, and therefore, yeah, I'll, you know, I'll do it, but I'm in no hurry to get, to get it in. Well, my thought on that is, is, is something like this, that if you're late on an assignment or two and there's a reason for it, you didn't understand something, you were ill, had to go out of town for an emergency or whatever, no problem whatsoever. If you continuously turn in things late, that's a sign that something needs to change. It's like a warning sign, right? And maybe you need to spend more time on this class. Maybe you're trying to get by with too little time on this class, all right? Or maybe you're falling behind because you're having difficulty with the material and you need to ask more questions. You need to see me during office hours or come to uh, other class of labs or whatever. So if you start getting where assignments are late continuously, then that's a sign that something ought to change. All right? One thing that I often do, by the way, is um, give you an opportunity to rework an assignment if it's not correct. Sometimes uh, people think they're doing it correctly and maybe they misunderstood the instructions or misunderstood how to do something or whatever, in which case I try to emulate what would happen in a, in a job situation. If you didn't do something right that you're supposed to do for your job, the boss isn't going to tell you, okay, well, forget about that. Go on to the next task. They're going to tell you, fix the first thing, right? And so I aim to do sort of that same thing. More about incompletes, more about casework, coursework, rather. Uh, essentially, projects and homework. We'll talk about uh, these two things. Uh, homework is roughly uh, an assignment a week. Some assignments will count two weeks. The longer you have on it, typically the more points it's going to be worth. And the project's worth 30 points. We'll probably glance at the project today and then uh, cover it in more detail later on. Are there any questions at this point? Okay. The material is divided into modules. And there's a module each week. All right, and that contains the stuff that we're going to be going over, maybe some examples. All right, actually, I want to get rid of this. We'll keep this. 
and things that I would give as handouts. And every week there will be, or most every week, there'll be an assignment. All right. So this is the assignment for this week, uh, Lab 1, and it's due September 4th, which is next Wednesday. Now you might say, well, that's interesting. Um, the assignment's due Wednesday. We don't have class on Wednesday. We have class on Tuesdays and Thursdays. Well, that gives you an opportunity to come into lab Wednesday, ask questions. I'm sorry, come to lab Tuesday, ask questions, get them answered, and fix your assignment so that it can be turned in on Wednesday. Review these. Here's a fair use guide uh, guidelines. Uh, this is for if you're using images on your web pages. Um, you know, images are you know, an important part of, of many web pages. And you, if you're doing a project or if you're doing an assignment, you might want to include uh, images on your pages. Uh, that's fine, but remember that most images are copyrighted. And therefore, you're not just allowed, even as a student, you're not just allowed just to take as many images as you want from wherever you want. You have to essentially do like you would do in a paper. Don't take too much and give credit to where you've gotten the picture from. And that's what the fair use handout covers. Client side versus server side scripting, we're going to be talking about this today. And you should read that on your own. ASP.NET Overview. It's a little bit older, but it talks about some general notes about ASP.NET. Your first lab is here. I want you to create a web page about ASP.NET Web Forms, ASP.NET MVC, and ASP.NET Core. Now these terms probably don't mean anything to you right now. Well, that's what I want you to do. I want you to do some research online, read about these three topics, and create a web page about them. So search the internet to find information about these topics. Have about three, at least three links about each topic. Might be useful to sketch out your page before you go. And I'll go and add this in. You should write and summarize important points. So the, the links aren't enough. I want you to go in and write in your own words what those topics mean. All right? When I say in your own words, I, I mean in your own words. If you're quoting someone, then you should put quote marks around it or otherwise indicate that it's not your words. Block quote tag, maybe, or anything else that you've learned in HTML that would do that. All right. It is interesting, and I had over the summer uh, in my 121 class, they had to write a short paper on something. I'm not sure what. And it's funny because, you know, after you teach for a while, you get a sense of how students talk. And I'm not saying there's anything wrong with it, but students generally don't talk in flowery, technical, academic kind of language, you know. So, sometimes you read something that a student turns in, and you can literally pull a sentence out of it, Google it, and you see exactly what they wrote, the whole paper, all right? So, 
you know, if you're going to take and you're going to quote something from someone, all right, give them credit, just like you would in a term paper, right? If you found something that really explains something really well and you don't think you can put it in better words, take that sentence or a couple of sentences, quote it, and give credit to where you got it from. Beyond that, though, put it in your own words. Read several sources and digest them. Put them all together and come up with a good explanation, a good summary of these different topics. Your page should look like a completed professional web page. And this is an instruction for every assignment that we're going to have. This is not a class in web design. All right? We're going to be doing mainly programming and coding and back-end stuff. All right. However, you should use this class to practice and to reinforce any web design skills that you have. All right. And we'll talk about that. But make your pages look professional. Make your pages look like something that I would find if I was just Googling the topics out on the web. All right. It's amazing how it doesn't even take a lot to do that, right? But try to raise your sights beyond like, oh, I must do the absolute minimum to complete this assignment, to saying, what do I need to do to do a good job on this assignment? All right? Because it really, really, really makes a big difference. All right? To just spend a little bit of time, pay attention to how it looks, put some CSS in there to make it look a little better, and it will really make your pages look more complete, more professional. And even though the focus of this class isn't that, it's assumed that you already know that from previous classes, and you can go and learn and expand on it and practice it. Questions? Last thing I want to look at, or two more things I want to look at before we uh, get into the actual topic. One is the semester project. Which I forgot to adjust the dates for. So either you guys are really late or you have plenty of time to get this done. Uh, I will revise the dates on this. This will be due probably sometime late October, mid to late October, and this will be due at the very end of the semester. For the semester project, you are to create a database application It's another mistake here. It's worth 10 and 20, not 20 a piece. So I will probably make some revisions to this. Uh, I am revising this course a bit this semester from previous semesters. Uh, sometimes I try to teach courses pretty similar from semester to semester, but every now and then you have to update the courses, right, with new material and all that. So there's going to be some revisions to this. But in a nutshell, you're going to create a database application, and uh, you're going to do it in two pieces. You're going to design it and then you're going to present the, the finished product. So the design, again, will be due uh, probably sometime in October the, or, or possibly early November, and the finished product will be due at the end of, at the, end of the semester. So uh, I'll make revisions to that, and I'll post when it's been updated and spend some time and read through that. The last thing I want to talk about is an experiment I'm doing this semester. One problem that I've had, one, one thing that I've been trying to work on as a teacher, is providing you more timely feedback on your assignments. I teach a lot of classes, and I'm not saying that as an excuse, I'm just sort of setting the picture for you. Uh, I teach a lot of classes. I teach a couple at University of Akron in the partnership program, and I also teach uh, a lot of classes here, both on campus and online. 
So it's been easy for me to get behind. And I've tried my best to keep up, and I've tried different things, and I've had some progress sometimes, and fallen short other times. I'll admit it. All right? And I know that that's not good. And I know that students work best if they're given good, timely feedback. So what I'm going to do this semester is something that I've done in a couple of my classes in the past, and it worked pretty well. But we're going to start out with this sort of as an experiment. And that is, when you submit it, just give yourself whatever grade you want. No, I'm just joking. You're like, hey, I like this experiment. What I'm going to do is the second lab period of each week will be devoted to you showing me what you've done and me grading it, all right? And we should be able to do it. We have 15 or so people in class. If you do a good job on your assignments and you've really nailed it, usually it just takes a minute to grade, all right? So therefore, um, you know, uh, I expect to be able to get through it. So the second lab period of each week is devoted towards me grading your assignments. So I'll grade it with you right there, all right? With you right there. So I can give you feedback quickly, and I can give you thorough feedback. It's hard sometimes to write and explain everything that I want to say in that little box, all right? Sometimes it works out better for me to face-to-face -face tell you, well, stuff doesn't line up. And by not lining up, I mean that when you make the browser window, see how that overlaps that? If I can actually show you that, then it becomes immediately clear to you what I'm trying to say instead of you trying to decipher my text. Not understanding it, send me an email two days later, me responding a day later. It's much better just to grade it face-to-face -face and do that. If you're not done, show me where you're at so I can maybe look at and point you in the right direction. So that's the second lab period of each week. And that's why the lab is due Wednesday instead of due on either Tuesday or Thursday. It gives you a chance to fit to ask questions on Tuesday, work on it some more, get it in on Wednesday, and then Thursday I'll look at it together with you. Now, not this week, of course, because your lab isn't even due until next week. So we won't do that in lab this coming week, but for all subsequent weeks, the, Tuesday, the Thursday of the week will be devoted to grading stuff. And it's an experiment. We'll see how it goes. I'm hopeful that uh, this will be something positive, both for me and, and for you. So away we go with that. Any questions over any of this? Oh, that's a lot of stuff. All right. Please go by and read these things in detail, because like I said, I only really hit the highlights. All right, now onward and upward. And I'm going to use an analogy that I use um, often. And I don't know, this class is right before lunch, right, for me. So I like to use food analogies, and it's, they're especially meaningful for me when I do them, like, right before lunch. All right, so let's pick sandwich places. All right, let's pick McDonald's and Subway. All right, now there's a difference between ordering sandwiches from McDonald's and Subway. Yes, can I help you? Would you be able to help me? It says on my schedule 206, but there's nobody in there. Is that what can I see your schedule? It's all right. Just been wandering around for like 20 minutes. Oh, well. It says business building 206. Can I see? Yeah. Wow. <laughs> Sorry. It's, it's okay. Me. Thank you. Business building 206. Oh, one, oh, my bad. It might be. 11 to 11.50. Business, business 209. Oh. And I'm then the, at it wrong. the lab is 106. Sorry. Okay, Thank no you. problem. Yeah, 
what, what did I do when I came in? This is the right room, right? Yeah. yeah. Uh, okay, what's the difference between ordering a sandwich from Subway and McDonald's? Okay, that's one difference. If I order a hamburger at McDonald's or a fish sandwich or a chicken sandwich or whatever, all right, what's the server probably going to do? Especially, let's say it's lunch hour where they're, they, they know they have a lot of people coming in. They're going to give you something that's pre-made. going to give you something that's pre-made, right? In other words, if I go in, now again, there's exceptions to this, so don't, don't, try to poke holes in this analogy, all right? But typically, if you go in during peak hours, let's say, at McDonald's, you know, they know that a lot of people are ordering Big Macs or whatever, so they have a bin full of them. And they just crank out the fries, right? And they just put bags of fries there, and whoever orders them gets them. So the idea is that the server at McDonald's, someone makes the things, puts them there, and all the server does is deliver them to the customer, to the client, all right? So the client comes in and says, I want a cheeseburger and fries. The server looks, looks in the bin, sees a cheeseburger, sees the fries, picks them up, puts them in the bag. They're on their way, all right? Well, maybe that's okay if all you want is a basic cheeseburger with fries, the way McDonald's makes it, and so on. How is it when you order a sandwich at Subway? We should take, we have a Subway on campus. We should take a field trip and go and do it, all right? How, what happens when you order a sandwich at Subway? They make it right in front of you, all right? Why couldn't they do what McDonald's does? It's too many options, right? At Subway, you can get different kinds of bread, all right? So you can get, I don't know, Italian, Italian herb, whole wheat, oatmeal wheat, I think, whatever. There's a whole list of options. And for each step of the way, there's options. There's the kind of sandwich you want. There's the kind of cheese that you want. Do you want it toasted or not toasted? Do you want this vegetable on it, this vegetable on it, this vegetable on it? If you did the math, if you've ever done like permutations and com combinations and stuff, that adds up quickly. Like let's just take a simple case where all we're going to consider is cheese, bread, and, uh, and meat. Let's say there are eight options for meat, five options for bread, six options for cheese, and two options for whether you want it toasted or not. All right? It's 40, 240, 480 types of sandwiches with just those parameters. Times two, right? Because you can have a six inch or 12 inch. Now, when you start adding in, what sauce do you want? Do you want mayonnaise or uh, sweet onion teriyaki sauce or whatever? There's probably seven sauces. When you have each of the vegetables, yes, no, for each of the vegetables. So you're literally in the thousands of combinations for sandwiches there. So they couldn't have a bin with everything. Wait a minute, you wanted the ham with mustard on wheat with spinach, provolone cheese, not toasted. Let me find the bin for that, you know. It just wouldn't work. You couldn't have all those sandwiches pre-made sitting there for someone. So what do they do? They make it on the fly. So, as some way they don't have bins full of completed sandwiches, like other fast food places do, like some fast places do. This is not a commercial for Subway, by the way. However, that being said, I do eat a lot of times at Subway now that it's on campus. And 
If they would want to give me like a discount for mentioning this, if anyone sees this on YouTube, we can talk. All right. I think I think it's fair. Right. Maybe I could even come in and make sure that I get a drink from Subway and hold it up to the camera as I'm sipping it. And, you know, I don't know. Wear a Subway T-shirt. Hey, you know, you got to do what you can. You know, this is uh, you know, these times are tough. You know, you got to do what you can to get by. Right. Anyhow. It wouldn't work to have bins full of pre-made sandwiches at Subway. It could at McDonald's, again, remembering that there's you know, limitations to this analogy, but could at McDonald's because the choices are relatively few. There's not different kinds of buns that you can get. There's one kind of bun. Every cheeseburger looks a lot like every other cheeseburger. So yeah, you can make them in advance, put them in the bin, and get ready to go. At Subway, however, you don't have completed sandwiches, the server has a recipe for sandwiches. The server knows how to make a sandwich. So if you order a, what's that one sandwich, a, a BMT or something like that? If you order a BMT, they know exactly what, they, what goes into that. If you order a spicy Italian, they know what goes into that and so on. So they have a recipe for these sandwiches. They get input from you, the client as to specifics about it, all right? And they take all that to create something for you on the fly, right there, and deliver it to you. Now, here's the interesting thing. Two totally different ways of going about it, but at the end of the day, you both have sandwiches. The person that went to McDonald's, the person that went to Subway. Why? Well, because that's what you eat for lunch, right? A sandwich. You can't eat a recipe, right? You have to eat a recipe that has been fulfilled and implemented in order to create a sandwich. So in both cases, you get sandwiches. Just the, the, the history and the path that it took to create those sandwiches is different in the case of McDonald's and Subway. Okay. Um, that has nothing to do with this course. I'm just, I just like Subway. No, I'm just kidding. That has everything to do with this course because what that points to is the difference between static web pages and dynamic web pages. All right? Those of you that are at CISS 216, you dealt with and you created static web pages. What does that mean to say something's a static web page? Does it change? Anyone else? Doesn't change. Well, it could change, but it requires manual intervention for it to change. So if you went back to CISS 216, all right, those of you that have taken it, and you had the thumb drive, and you had the first lab that you turned in in CISS 216, if you viewed that page today, it looks exactly like it looked when you turned it in. All right? Exactly. And it's going to stay that way unless you go in and manually change the code to look different. All right? That's a static page. Static means not changing or at least not changing without intervention. Now, that works for some things. If I have, for example, a web page for a restaurant, Let's say a simple restaurant, not a big national chain or something, a mom and pop restaurant. I could probably make a series of static pages that would work for them, right? I have a home page. I might have con a page for contact information. I might have a page that shows a menu. I might have a page that says that they do catering. And restaurants don't change their menus every day, you know, maybe once every year or six months or something. And they probably don't change the way that they cater too often. Um, so I could make maybe a static website for a restaurant that would work just fine. Because that information doesn't really change that often. Now, if you consider, though, something like Google, how could there be static pages with Google? Well, let, let's forget about Google for now. Let's think of Amazon. How could there be static pages for Amazon? How many products do you think Amazon sells overall? Billions. Yeah, 
I would say literally, possibly in the billions, definitely the millions. They sell a lot of them. Do you think they have a web designer, web developer, that goes in and manually creates an HTML page for each of the products that Amazon sells? That would be ridiculous, right? There's, there's no way that that could even be feasible, right? If you can imagine, how many new products come out every week, right? DVD releases, music releases, you know, new, you know, new apparel items, new clothing items, whatever, household items. Thousands, if not millions of products, new products probably come out every week or every month, anyhow, all right? So, you see, it would be totally impractical to have static pages for that. And if you thought about it a little longer, things like search functionality, anything like that, couldn't possibly work. So what do they do, all right? They use the approach of having not a completed web page for every product, but a recipe to create a product page. All right? Just like Subway doesn't have thousands of sandwiches sitting in the bin, they have recipes of how to make a sandwich. All right? And based on your input, that recipe gets fulfilled and a sandwich is made. So let's draw a sketch that I'll draw probably a lot of times, and I draw it in, in most all of my classes. Client. Internet. Internet's drawn as a cloud because we don't care in this class the details of what happens in there. The request just goes from here to there. That's all we know. That's all we care about. We know it's not as simple as that, but we just don't care about the details. What is a client and a server? Someone care to define those terms, client and server. The machines are used at both ends. All right, that's good. What does it mean when you say both ends? Where the information is stored to the user. Okay. Trying to access it. Yeah, client is a user. Now, in the case of a static web page, those HTML pages, and I'm saying HTML pages, but it could include CSS and JavaScript as well, those complete web pages, are stored on the server. Client makes a request, and the server has a response. In the case of a static web page, our simple restaurant website that we talked about before, client says, I want a page. That request goes through the internet and ends up at the proper server. We don't care how that happens in this class. We just know that it does. The server then fulfills that request. It finds the appropriate page and files and sends those back to the client as a response. And again, it's a package that consists of HTML, CSS, and JavaScript. And maybe other files, images, and so on. So a little more formal definition of client and server is a client is a system that makes a request. A server is a system that responds to requests. Of static pages, the request and response are simple. 
because everyone gets the same stuff back. All right. If you request this hypothetical restaurant's homepage and I request it, if someone in Brazil requests it, if someone in Germany requests it, they're getting the same page. All right. Because it's static, it doesn't change unless someone manually goes in and changes the site. So, that's a static website. Now, a dynamic website, how is that different? Well, it's different in a couple of different ways. All right? First of all, the request from the client could be accompanied by input from the user. Think of doing a Google search, all right? Google searches are totally not feasible or, or incomprehensible if, unless you consider dynamic web pages. Because they're going to have, you know, if they did it with static pages, you mean to tell me they have a web page for every possible thing that anyone could ever search for? That doesn't even make sense, right? So obviously something else is going on. And therefore, in dynamic pages, the user input becomes a factor. In addition to user input, there can be other things that come from the user that may affect the dynamic page. All right? What do you think some of those other things might be instead of uh, in addition to user input? Location. Your location. All right. Uh, a great example of that is if I Googled, uh, you know, uh, pizza place. All right. It's probably here in Elyria going to give me pizza places that are near Elyria, Ohio. All right. Um, whereas if someone in New York Googled it, it would give them a piece of places in New York. Actually, the client's IP address is set, and the server can translate that to an approximate location. What else is included when a client makes a request that the script might use? Any thoughts? Cookies. Cookies. Possibly past history of searching. For example, if you search for a particular topic a lot. Google will use that information in doing subsequent searches. The best example I can think of that is doing a, doing a Google search for Don Cherry. Don Cherry, is, there's two people named Don Cherry that are kind of famous. One is a hockey announcer in Canada. I, he wears ridiculously wild sports coats, I think. All right. The other is a jazz musician. So, if you have the history of doing a lot of searches about hockey, and you search for Don Cherry, the search results based on uh, for the hockey announcer is going to take uh, you know is going to be shown more prominently than for the jazz musician. If you did a lot of search for jazz music, then the reverse is going to be true. So yeah, your history has an impact on your search results. That's actually an interesting, an interesting uh, question for a sociology class. All right, because you think of Google as being it's technology. It's not doesn't have any bias, right? It's just technology. Think about it, though. And again, we don't talk politics in this class, not specific politics. But 
if you do searches that have a particular political lean to them, all right, and if you consistently do that, your search results are going to be skewed to give you more of the same. So if you search for a lot of right-wing information, your search results are going to be flavored with right-wing websites. If you search for left-wing information, your search results will be flavored with left-wing websites. And that's interesting, right? That's interesting uh, because you're getting fed more of what you've already liked, all right? Which in a way is good, right? Let's think of something maybe more innocent. See, I, I even get itchy just starting to talk about politics, right? Let's talk about music, all right? That that's, should be a little less com, uh, controversial. And think of Spotify or, or things like that. Uh, you get recommendations based on the stuff that you have liked before, which is kind of cool, right? But how then do you discover something that's really totally off the wall and different then? You might not. All right, so I don't know. These things, you, you, you don't think of these things in terms of social issues, but they do have social impacts as well, right, interestingly enough. But that's a topic for another class. Bring that up to your sociology professor, those of you that are taking that. All right, anyhow, we talked about how static pages are work. We didn't talk about how dynamic pages work. We're in the process of doing that. Some of the other things that would be a factor would be your platform. If you're on a Windows machine and you do a search for certain kinds of software, you're going to get results based on Windows. Likewise, if you're on an Android device and you search for certain kinds of software, you're going to get stuff geared towards the Android and so on down the line. Exactly. Your browser, I'll just say in general terms your platform. So, browser, OS, screen resolution, sure. All this stuff comes as part of the user input. And that is sort of the ingredients, or some of the ingredients, in the recipe to put together your dynamic page. So, in the case of dynamic pages, you don't have pre-written web pages. You have recipes, scripts, or programs that take this user input might very likely interact with a database server. All right? Just like a subway clerk takes what your answers, your user input, interacts with, I guess, a database would be the ingredients that they have, and follows the script, which is a recipe, to put together your sandwich. All right? When I do a Google search, it knows my location. It knows the term that I typed in the search bar and all those things. The script takes that along with the database of all of the websites and the index and all that that Google has indexed and creates a search result just for you. All right? It's really amazing when you think of that. All right? that is customized just for you. Your input, your search history, your uh, location, your platform, all those things go into doing a search of the Google database and producing via a script a web page just for you. 
Now, a couple clear uh, uh, key things uh, before we close today. Number one, remember that regardless of the process, whether it be a static or dynamic page, the user gets back an HTML page. All right? Just like the user at McDonald's and Subway gets a sandwich no matter what process they've gone through. So yeah, in the case of a dynamic page, the script runs. The database server is brought into play. The user input is used. All those things are factors and in ingredients that the script uses in figuring out the results. But at the end of the day, when the server is done processing that script, the response it gives is still a web page, still an HTML page. All right? Second thing to realize, and this is just sort of a, 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 an interesting side comment. Remember we talked about clients and servers, right? Interesting thing is here, in this situation, the web server is actually a client for the database server. All right? So when we say a machine is a, cli is a client or a server, we're talking about within the context of a very specific transaction. So in this case, the web server is a server as far as satisfying requests for web pages. But it itself is a client to a database server. It's important to, to realize that. And then there's other clients for the database server. Now, ASP.NET, where does that fit into this? ASP.NET is one of the ways that are used to create dynamic web pages. So ASP.NET would be a framework techniques along with C sharp as one of the ways by which dynamic web pages are created. Is anyone aware of other platforms for creating dynamic web pages? Angular, all right. Anything else? PHP, Python. That's a little. That's that's a little bit. That's related, but not exactly the same thing here. Ruby on Rails would be another one. All these things are platforms, are ways that dynamic web pages are created and delivered to a client. Now, conceptually, they work the same. The details of ASP.NET versus PHP, you know, they're very different technologies, but in terms of the function that they perform, they perform the same thing. Just like a motorcycle is different than an automobile in a lot of ways, but the function, getting from here to there, is the same. Well, these different technologies, PHP and so on, are, are very different, yet they still serve the same role. All right? Next time, we're going to talk about ASP.NET in more detail. All right? And we'll focus in on exactly the mechanics of how that works. All right. That's all I have. I'll go unlock lab, and we'll be, I'll come back to grab my video files then.